Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of To The Point Podcast. So everybody's doing well this morning. Um, a lot of crazy action in the NHL last night. A double overtime game. Uh, another Nazem Kadri suspension along the way. The Winnipeg Jets shutting down Connor McDavid in the uh, North Division's playoff opener last night. So a lot to get into today. We'll also preview the um, Toronto-Montreal matchup um, and also three other ma- three other games that will be on the, uh, on the ticket tonight. Um, and also, as we saw, a great playing game uh, between the Warriors and Lakers. I didn't think the game would be that close, but LeBron uh, does LeBron-like things, makes a game winner at the buzzer, sends the Lakers into the postseason. So we'll tee that up. And also, this weekend, it's the PGA Championship. It's just started, actually, uh, in the last half hour. And oddly enough, John Daly is in the lead after one hole, after birdieing one. So a um, lot to talk about today. Just a little housekeeping off the top. I'm doing a podcast like I normally do tomorrow morning, uh, talking about the games tonight. I'm sure there'll be a uh, lot of action. There's controversy every night when it comes to the NHL and, you know, the other hot topics around the world of sports. But also tomorrow morning, I'm going to be recording a NBA uh, season preview podcast that was supposed to happen last night. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties, so we're going to work that out. We're going to do that tomorrow morning. So you can find that. Uh, it'll be um, available uh Sometime this weekend, likely uh, Friday morning. So a couple of podcasts dropping your way this weekend. Where we'll talk about tee up all the matchups in the NBA. Talk about um, the play-in tournament. We thought about it as a whole, and uh, where we see the playoffs going and the uh, pretenders, contenders, and and everything you need to know to uh, be ready for the NBA playoffs. Where the playoffs um, proper, uh, that's not the play-in tournament. They will start Saturday afternoon. Milwaukee, Miami. It's a three o'clock start. I think the games go 3, 6, 9, 11, 30 on, um, on Saturday. And then it was announced this morning the Lakers will start their postseason against the Suns Sunday afternoon. So NBA action, we're going to have NHL. You got the PGA. You got the uh, Roland Garros, the French Open, and tennis coming up in just about a week. So it's, it's jam-packed, uh, to say the least, here when it comes to sports. And it's not even including Major League Baseball where you see – you know, some crazy things happening. Shohei Otani having a, a ERA under 220 with 14 home runs to, to cap it all off. Um, and his fantastic start. Uh, the Toronto Blue Jays uh, lose last night, but they've been on a hot streak of late, um, right behind Boston for top of the American League East. And, uh, you know, some great storylines in baseball as well. So as we go into the playoffs, of course, there's a lot of games right now, a lot of series. So they take up a lot of my my viewing time, but as we progress, we'll, we'll, I'll talk about more baseball, everything else. You know, I don't like to stay behind on much. If you know me, I, uh, I try to watch as much as I can. So, um, I'll keep you guys all up to date as I go, but I thought let's start today. I'm talking about the first game last night. I was going to talk about Tampa, Florida, cause I didn't get a chance to, um, proper. I was on with Craig last night under review. We talked about that series. You can check that out on the uh, FDS podcast podcast networks, Facebook page, but Washington, Boston game three, this is really the swing game. And then you see after a series, that's one, one, the team that wins game three over 75% of the time will win that series. And going into last night, I, I thought it could go either way. I mean, the first two games go into overtime. They're really, these teams are so even they're really, um, they're well matched when it comes to skill and uh, what they bring to the table. And it was no different last night. So we head into the game last night, and it really was a lethargic start for the Washington Capitals, where they brought nothing to the table. Uh, they five on five this entire postseason. Really, they haven't had it. We haven't seen a really dangerous team. Their most effective line, five on five by far, has been their fourth line of Carl Hagelin, Garnet Hathaway, and Nick Dowd, and that continued last night. Um, they they broke up. They got. Um, Vigeny Kuznetsov back in the lineup. So he was centering Ovechkin and Tom Wilson, but it, it just didn't, I mean, the best two lines five on five for the Washington Capitals last night were the Dowd Hathaway line. And then Shiri, Daniel Carr, the Shiri, Daniel Carr line, uh, where, and Raffle, sorry, you can't, you're not going to win many games when those guys are bringing the offense, five, the Ovechkin line with Kuznetsov, Kuznetsov played his first game since May 1st. It showed last night. I don't think he had much uh, to bring to the table. 
Ovechkin's just been a bit off for me. Um, when it comes to the power play, when it comes to just his overall, I think physically, of course, you're seeing it night in, night out, him bring it. But he just seems a bit off when it comes to his play. Um, I, I could say the same thing um, about Nick Backstrom. I don't think Nick Backstrom is particularly good in the se- uh, series. John Carlson, I think, has been really awful. Uh, again, last night, I don't think he played very well. So Washington's big boys haven't been bringing it. But yet, we haven't seen them play a good game yet. And they go into last night. And it's the first period. It's a slugfest of just penalties. Uh, we see some, we see some dumb ones. You know, we see Charlie take a slash. Then John Carlson takes a, a puck over glass. Boston, Boston gets a big five on three. And Washington's credit, they kill it off. And what does Washington have in net? Well, Simpson off. They got rid of Craig Anderson. Simpson off back. He hasn't played a game since May first either. Him and Kuznetsov have been on the COVID list all year uh, and been really. Um, malcontents in Washington, but to his credit, he hasn't played in you know 18 days and he comes in and, and stonewalls them in the first period. It plays great. We get to the second period where Boston and Washington both are pretty stingy, but Marshan takes a stupid penalty and he uh, he gets involved after the whistle, does a little bit too much, throws an extra punch with the ref right in his face. The ref calls him on it. We don't see that too often when it's a guy like Marshan going off. But, you know, he didn't love it, of course, but he takes the penalty and Washington goes on the power play. And their power plays was terrible to that point. In the series, it was one for eight. And it tells you all you need to know. I mean, the Washington power play has been special for years with Ovechkin in his office, with Oshi in the slot. You got Backstrom, who's just like the surveyor, who will pass it to whoever, whoever's open. John Carlson at the top of the key and they eventually break through. Uh, it's a little breakdown. They get the second power play unit out. Anthony Mantha's below the net. He throws the puck in front, no uh, defensive or uh, the, f- the forward wasn't there to cover Ovechkin. He comes all the way in. He beats uh, Tuka Rask over the shoulder. One, nothing Washington, but like this series, you get a little momentum. It's gone rather quickly. 30 seconds later, Taylor Hall finds a puck down low. Gets on his back end, puts it under the arm of Samsonov. We're tied at one. And you know this was this was a theme throughout throughout this whole series and throughout the game where a team grabbed momentum and it was gone rather quickly. So second period, some more power plays, but it's again one one for a while. But a minute forty five left in the period, the Nick Dowd line strikes again, and. He Garner Hathaway gets a shot. He gets a stick on it going through the lane, beats, goes through the legs of Tuka Rask, 2 1 Washington in the second period. And did I think they were going to hold the lead? No, because we saw it in game two where they had a lead. Taylor Hall scored with two and a half and they go to overtime. Boston wins it. I didn't necessarily think Boston would win the game, but I definitely thought Boston would tie the game. In Washington, the regular season was known for giving up leads. It could be, they didn't always lose the game, but they could be leading 5-1. It's 5-4 with a minute left and they have to scramble. So we're going to the four, to the third period. Um, you know, Nick Dowd, who, I, who was playing great, great series. He's got two goals. Hathaway's got two goals. Again, that's their best line. He takes a really bad hooking penalty. It's in the middle of the ice. Marshan doesn't have the puck. And he just, he's probably pissed off with him. You know, Marshan, the whole series has been, good at getting in people's faces, pissing them off. So he gives him a little, hey, how are you, little hook. Marshan falls to the ice pretty easily, but it was a penalty. And on the power play, who scores a tie it but Brad Marshan. And, you know, these these two guys were the two players to score game-winning goals in this series, Nick Dowd in overtime game one, Marshan with the overtime winner in game two. So it's only fitting that they both get – the go-ahead goals, and they're both getting the penalties on both of their go-ahead goals in this game. It's a little fun continuity there. Um, but, you know, that takes us into overtime. We see the first overtime's really kind of clogged up. The better team was clearly Boston to me. Again, Washington, I, I just thought to myself going into the overtime, I don't see Washington winning this game because five on five, they give you nothing. And kind of stayed that way. And we go through a whole overtime period. Uh, Marshan got a really good look on Samsonov. Bergeron did as well. The perfection line really started to cook, but Samsonov, to his credit, he hung in there. We get to second overtime, and 
you can see you guys are starting to get fatigued. I mean, it's only natural. They played two overtime games already. We go into double overtime. And Samsonov stops the puck behind the net. Routine play. And he does it a little casually. He thinks Justin Schultz is going to get to the puck first. But Schultz was on a long shift. He and Samsonov goes back to his net very casually. So Craig Smith beats Justin Schultz to the puck, wraps it, wraps it around Samsonov. That's the ball game. Boston wins it three to two. And we saw it after the game. Ovechkin was giving lip to Samsonov in Russian. Uh, he was not pleased with, with his careless play. And it was definitely, I mean, Samsonov was playing great to that point, 40 plus saves. He was the third star of the game. But you can't make that play at that time. You just can't. Um, he, yeah, it's a long game. You haven't played in forever, but you got to know there's got to be better communication there between Schultz. Schultz has got to tell him I'm dead here. Move the puck, throw it up the boards, do something, but I, I'm not getting there first. And it wasn't even close. Col Craig Smith put the jets on noticing what was happening. And the game was over before Sam Sonoff even realized that, you know, the puck was in the net. And tough loss for Washington. But should they have won this game? No, if you ask me. Because their five-on-five -five play is atrocious. Ovechkin, Backstrom, I think Mantha, Wilson have been solid. in this. I think Anthony Mantha's have had a really good series. Um, I, I question the pickup because of the price. I still do. But he, I think he's had a really solid playoff to start. Um, he's been... Involved physically, he's chipped in offensively. You can't ask more from Anthony Mantha. Um, power play, again, he assisted Ovechkin. But a couple things that Washington's going to win this series. Number one, five and five play, get some high quality scoring chances. The Boston defense is, a not, is not a threat. McAvoy's playing fantastic, the best hockey of his career. Kevin Miller's clearly hurt. He's always limping around. He, can't participate in practice in practice on days off. He doesn't take morning skates. So to me, that tells me he's getting shot up before the game and then he just plays and not, you know, performance enhancing drugs, but just, you know, a cortisone shot or something like that to be able to play. And then after that, you know, you just, you battle through it. So he's not, he's slow on, on the best day. Clifton, Clifton's not a very good defenseman. That's just fact. Uh, I don't know why you don't attack him. And you're not going to win the series with Dowd and Hathaway being your best offensive players. Because last night in overtime, they were getting pretty much every second shift, which I don't blame Peter Laviolette because they were the only ones bringing anything. Carr, Roffel, Sheary was the other line. First two lines for Washington didn't bring enough. So if I'm Laviolette, I'm looking at Ovechkin, I'm looking at my leaders back from saying, what do you got here? Because we need more. And you also got to tell John Carlson to wake up. Uh, he's been turning the puck over. On the power play, he's throwing really bad passes. He turns in his own zone. He's a flat-out liability right now. Uh, and I'm not going to say he's hurt because it's when you're on the ice, you're 100%. Whether you are or you aren't. I've heard that from pro athletes. Once you get on the ice, there's no excuses. So play better. Just point blank. Dmitry Orlov's been fantastic for, for the Capitals. He's been their best defenseman, bar none. He's been one of the best players in this postseason. But for Washington, that's the key. For Boston, stay out of the box, because who knows when this power play will wake up, and when it does, you do not want to be on the opposite side of it. I think their best players have been – I think Marchand's been fantastic in this series. Pasternak's been a little quiet for me. Bergeron hasn't been fantastic either. But you look at – um, you know, Craig Smith gets the winner last night. They, they're they getting – Taylor Hall, I think, has been their best – one. him and Marshall have been pretty close when it comes to being their best forward. It's hard to argue that Taylor Hall hasn't been one of the more dynamic players for the Boston Bruins. But Rask continue to be solid. Um, their power play could also use some work. Uh, it went one for five last night. So not exactly uh, game-changing when it comes to their power play opportunities. So – this series is 2-1, three overtime games in a row, only the eighth time in the history of the league. And 
I don't expect game four to be any less tight. Um, it's, it's, it's been a tight series from jump and these two teams are so similar. They know each other's tendencies now after playing all year and, and three playoff games that the team that can really just find it five on five or even find it on special teams. Cause if these refs are calling it like they did last night, a team's going to have an opportunity to win a game on the power play. And I don't love that particularly in the playoffs because I'd rather see it get finished five on five and not have a, a power play save you. But with the referees calling it the way they is, the way they are, you know, comparing it to the Tampa Florida series, then if your power play can find it, then you could win it. You can win the series easy, but Game four, uh, Friday night in Boston, same time, 7.30. I think it's a must win for Washington, for sure. You don't you don't want to go down 3-1. Uh, even though you're heading back home, you want it evened up. You get home ice advantage back. You have a best of three with two games on your home ice. You take your chances with that. But, you know, credit to the, to the Bruins for being a little bit more mentally strong than the Washington Capitals last night because Tuka Ras wouldn't have made that mistake. Samsonov, a younger, inexperienced, first game back in 18 days, did, and it cost him the game. Um, we'll pivot into Carolina and Nashville. And this series might be the one that's least talked about nationally, um, just because it's Carolina and Nashville, and maybe it's routine that Carolina will win this series, and they are up 2-0 now after their win last night. But there are some big storylines from this. Um, Alex Nadolkovich, he's 23, had a really, it was a high second round pick, had a lot of talk about, he's, uh, he was a goaltender for the, for the Americans at the World Junior Hockey Championships, and just, he's been flat out sensational. Uh, game one lets in two goals, but it's his first career playoff start, they get the win. Last night, he gets a shutout in, in his second career playoff start, and it was a ballsy move for Rob Brendan Moore. To go to Nadolkovich. Think about it. Who's he got behind him? Peter Mrazek, who's been their guy the past couple of years. They got him from Detroit to be a starter, and he's been a really good goaltender for them. You can't say he's been a failure by any means. He's been a really stable presence in net. And then you also have Optimus Rhyme and James Reimer, who's been in Carolina for a number of years, and he's been solid as well. Uh, you know, does he have his playoff failures in Toronto? Yeah, but who, what player doesn't have their playoff failures in Toronto over the last two decades? Um, so to go to a kid when you have two veterans that have been there longer than him, but that's Rob Brendan Moore. And I would have made the same decision. Nadolkovic was the best goaltender this season. He's your future. And this Carolina team believes that they can win a Stanley cup. And they go into last night, right before puck trap, it comes up on my timeline that Jacob Slavin is going to be out for Carolina. Slavin's one of the best defensemen in the NHL. And, uh, you know, he's not, talked about when it comes to notoriety when it comes to scoring goals points but he's just a flat out defenseman that's what he does and missing him is a big loss but you know we've seen Brett Pesci show up in the playoffs before he, he continues to do that um, Jake Gardner steps in for uh, Slavin which I'm sure makes a lot of Leafs fans laugh but he played solid last night they got a solid decor Dougie Hamilton Pesci and they they just play you know, Brady Shea has been a solid presence for them since being acquired from the New York Rangers. And they're not going to be flashy. Maybe they're not the most fun team to watch, but they got their young kids who step up. It was a physical affair uh, last night where some chippiness for sure. Jordan Martinuk threw a hit on Alexander Carey. Well, I'm not sure if that's going to get looked at by the league. It was a shove into the boards and um, kind of defenseless. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a hearing. We'll talk about it. Talk about a hit that will be a suspendable play in just a bit here. But um, Carolina just – this is what they've done all year. They, they're they quiet. They don't need to be the center of attention when it comes to the game of the night. As you see, they put Boston-Washington first, then they throw Carolina in the middle, and then they throw Edmonton-Winnipeg. So they're expecting nobody to watch Carolina, Carolina and Nashville. And I did. But the, nationally, how many team, how many people are watching that series? You know, insiders will all say, oh, well, Jacob Slavin's out. Then that's it. They're done with that game. Or Martinuk's hit was dirty, su suspendable play. 
because they saw a video of it from a local reporter, not because they're watching the game. But, you know, Sebastian Ajo gets a pair, including the empty net goal with about 50 seconds left. They got good goaltending. They're solid defensively. And, you know, just early returns, they're up 2-0. Tampa's up 2-0. That could be the second round. And they're both um, with early leads and potentially both could be finishing their playoff series early. Um, And that would be a great series for sure, because I think Carolina, they've had their playoff success. They, they know what they're doing and they're not afraid of the moment. Uh, And I think just with their experience, they're going to come into that series just as confident as Tampa would. I mean, they finished first in that division beating out Florida and Tampa Bay for it. So it's not like they, just went through a, a crap division and, and ended up in first place. But they have a full solo barn there. You felt the emotion last night. And, you know, I'm sure people are envious here in Canada where the Edmonton-Winnipeg game was pretty silent. And uh, obviously there's no fans. And I don't find there was that much vitriol either. But, you know, that, that game had some emotion. You get Carolina winning again. And um, they'll meet tomorrow night in game three. But... Nashville's in tough. Uh, they can't score goals. They, uh, they're facing a hot goaltender. And if they want to make this a series, they need to win tomorrow night. And I want you to see what the crowd's like in Bridgestone because when there are fans in Nashville, it's loud. And it can get, um, can get pretty uh, rocky and rowdy uh, early and often in there. So Carolina takes a 2 nothing lead. Sebastian Ajo, Warren Fogle supply the offense. And the kid, Alex Nadolkovic, continues to prove why he's deserving of being Carolina's number one netminder throughout this postseason. That brings us to Winnipeg-Edmonton, the 10 o'clock game last night, the, the sandwich, the finishing off the bread sandwich between Winnipeg, uh, sorry, uh, Boston-Washington, Carolina, Nashville, and Winnipeg and Edmonton. And it was a really fast-paced game. That's one, one thing you say, that the periods flew by. There wasn't many whistles uh, they were playing free-flowing hockey. It, it was physical, but again, it had a different feel to it than the other series is for me. And that's what I've been saying from the jump. I The North is not going to be as physical as the other series. Maybe Toronto-Montreal will be tonight. It'll be a bloodbath. But I'm just looking at what I've watched all year. I saw Florida and Tampa play this year. They play a physical brand of hockey. Washington has Tom Wilson. They have guys that are going to bring it. I just don't see it from these two teams where you have guys that are really physical guys and they want to play that game. You look at the defense core on both teams, other than Darnell nurse, you know, Forbert's kind of a guy who's kind of greasy. He'll get in your face. He doesn't mind mucking it up, so to speak. But after that, it gets pretty thin. And I just look at this, the series and early on first period, both teams, I think the shots after the first period were five, three or five, four Edmonton. So play was to the outside. They weren't getting a lot of pucks to the net. And both teams are kind of sleepwalking. Again, uh, Winnipeg hadn't played since Friday. Uh, Edmonton hadn't played since Saturday. So it had been a bit of a, uh, a wait for this. You know, they've been sitting there waiting for this game. And it kind of showed in the first period. After that, teams did wake up. And I thought Edmonton carried the play throughout the whole entire second period and most beginning of the third period where Connor Hellebuck was the standout of the night. He made some incredible saves. Um you know, robbing Kyler Yamamoto late in the second period. We saw him make a big save on Tyson Berry late in the third. And, you know, yes, he pulled the RV, opens the scoring, and it was kind of like the floodgates were going to open for Edmonton, but they did. Hellebuck shut the door. They tightened up a little bit um, defensively, and they ultimately tied the game not too long after Tucker Pullman banging in a rebound for, for the Winnipeg Jets. And we head to the third period, and again, Hellebuck's playing great. Mike Smith's not bad on the other side either. He's making the saves he has to, keeping Edmonton in the game. But there's a shot from the point, and it hit Dominic Tignanato. And it actually went behind uh, went behind Smith, went top corner, but the ref didn't see it. So they go on and play for like three minutes, and there's no whistle. But then the play's just whistled down. And they go back and look at it, and Winnipeg had scored in the play. So they go back. It's a goal. And you know, they have to play those extra three minutes. But it was kind of a – I thought Edmonton kind of lost some juice because they're they, they had to solve the play. They're down 2-1, and we didn't see that resolve from this team. I've seen it from other groups. I don't think Edmonton had a lot of it last night. Connor McDavid was quiet, really quiet last night. I think Winnipeg did a good job. You know, you get Shifley up against 
McDavid, Shifley played great. Offensively, didn't bring much, but you're without Pierre-Luc Dubois. You're without Nick Ehlers. You need Shifley to be a really defensive stalwart. Then if you Shifley need a break, you throw Adam Lowry. Again, Adam Lowry, uh, they had to put Cobb up at center because Dubois was out. We got Lowry playing with Appleton and Perot. Lowry being the best third line center in hockey will drive whatever line he needs to defensively. And he did that all night. He was just effective at his role. And, you know, who supplies the offense? Tucker Pullman. Not known for his offensive capabilities, but it's the playoffs. And sometimes you just get random goals. Who assists him on the goal? Nate Thompson. A fourth line winger. You know, a journeyman player who's been in Winnipeg all year. But he's, he's an 8 to 10 point a year player. He gets two assists in this game. He gets two points on, on the first two goals. So we go to 2-1. Uh, Edmonton pulls the goalie, but uh, Winnipeg caps Blake Wheeler, gets an empty netter. They had another empty netter, and Winnipeg steals game one in Edmonton 4-1. And I think Hellebuck was fantastic. That's a big reason why they won this game. But I'll be interested to see in game two what McDavid and Drysaddle bring to the table because they were really quiet. And they're on separate lines. You saw Pooley Arvey playing with new uh, playing with McDavid. You saw uh, Nugent Hopkins and Yamamoto playing with Drysidle. They broke them up. Two different lines. Dave Tippett. You know, he, I think you you don't want to have one stack line because then your team's very one dimensional. This team does not have a lot of depth when it comes to scoring goals. But you may have to to win this series because I don't know. Drysidle is a fantastic player. But as a number one center on a line by himself, he's not as good. Obviously, they're better together. They're, they're unstoppable together. And I think they're either going to have to mix up shifts or maybe you double shift dry sidle. He steps up with McDavid and uh, Pooley RV for a shift. Or McDavid does the same thing with dry sidle and Eugene Hopkins. But I think you're going to need to see them both play with each other because together they're unstoppable. And last night, they just they both were quiet. And they haven't played in a while. They had to wait around. And we'll see what the, the Leafs have game is like tonight. If, if it's kind of a lethargic start, it's a little bit quiet. Uh, if teams are kind of trying to figure themselves out. Because looking at tonight's game, Montreal hasn't played since last Wednesday. So that's it's going to be a little eight days. And Toronto hasn't played since Friday. It's the same way as the Winnipeg Jets. But to Winnipeg's credit, you get great goaltending. I thought defensively, they weren't bad. You know, they didn't give McDavid a whole lot. Uh, they, they shut him down. They're for, I said before the series, the key to winning the series for the Jets is having your forwards, having your your centers really chip in defensively with your with, with to help your defense. You got Pionk, you got Morrissey. They're great number two, three defensemen. Pullman's a solid player. Forbert's kind of a, like a Zach Bogosian for Toronto. He's a fifth, sixth guy. You don't have that alpha. And defensively, these guys aren't fantastic. So you need your guys to step up. You need your your great defensive forwards. And their best defensive forward, Pierre-Luc Dubois, wasn't even playing last night. So that's a good sign for the Winnipeg Jets that you get a win where Pierre-Luc Dubois, who's a 200-foot player, wasn't even dressed. So you take that. But I'll, this is game two is about McDavid for me. What do you got? You had a great regular season, 105 points. You're going to win the – you won the Art Ross. You're going to win the uh, Ted Lindsay in all likelihood. You'll win the MVP, the Hart Trophy. But what do you got in the playoffs? And it's only one game. It was a best of seven. This was the NBA play-in. They'd be going home. This was the, the, the NFL. But it's not. You got more time to regroup. But I just didn't love the effort from the Edmonton Oilers last night. Um, and, again, I think shot total – can be a deceiving statistic because if you're getting a ton, a ton of shots, but they're all from the outside, well, great. That's an easy save for a goaltender. You could outshoot a team 42, 25, but show me the chart where the shots are coming from. Are they in the slot? Then yeah, you're dominant. But if they're from the outside, if they're, I think in Minnesota, Vegas game one, you know, I think Talbot was fantastic, but do who do I think made the tougher saves? Marc-Andre Fleury. Because Minnesota was getting high danger opportunities. They had less shots, but they had more high danger opportunities than Vegas did. And I think that's something you got to look into because it's not always about, well, we got 42 shots tonight. We should have won. Well, if they're off on the corner and they're off on the outside, should you score? They're not high danger. And NHL goaltenders making that save. So just something to think about um, when it comes to 
offense and what teams do because that it's not the opportunities are not all created the same. Being in the slot, getting to those tough areas is a difficult task. And the teams that do it more often than not win games. And in this case, Edmonton didn't do it. But game two is tomorrow night. Um, no word yet on Dubois or Ehlers. I think Dubois is closer to returning to Nick Ehlers. Uh, Nick Ehlers hasn't played since that game against Toronto where he was banged up uh, dealing with Joe Thornton. Dubois was hurt in the second to last game of the season. So they got to hope they can get those players back so that they can throw Cobb back on the third line with um, Appleton and Lowry. You can get Perot back on that fourth line. You can kind of balance out your lineup a little bit. But adding some more offensive creativity would never hurt this team either. But I picked the Jets to win the series with little little confidence in that selection, but I've been on them since the beginning of the season, and I'm not going to back off of them now. I still think they're a very good team and that they can do some damage. And clearly, they play their game. They can win They can win this series. They, they win game one, 4-1. So b- big win for, for Winnipeg on the road uh, in Edmonton. Our final game of the night, 11.30 start. Um, I got through about half the game, then I finished it this morning. Um, yeah, sleep's been, uh, sleep's gonna be hard to come by for me. I, uh, it's time of year. I, I like to watch every game because when I talk about it here, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about a game that I've ne- I haven't watched because that's irresponsible. Uh, it's just not smart. Uh, it's not what you do. Um, so I watched for, I, I tape games you know, openly. I, Last night was about one o'clock in the morning. I wake up about four o'clock. If you guys don't know, there's a little inside information about me. I'm up about four o'clock every morning. Uh, it's it's about three hours of sleep if you can do uh, basic math. So it's it's a struggle sometimes, but I, I it was a great game. I couldn't go to bed. I mean, last night we'll talk about Cadre's hit, which is a big deal. But the bigger deal last night was Nathan McKinnon. And I talked about it under review last night about how, yeah, you know, Connor McDavid's the best player in the world. Yeah, he is. And, you know, this year in the regular season, you can make the argument Austin Matthews was the second best player in the world. Sure. Is to me, and this is not a slouch, the second best player in the world is, is Nathan McKinnon. Austin's third. And that's, again, that's not a, that's not a dig at, at Toronto. That's not a dig at him. Watch Nathan McKinnon play. He's got five goals in two games, four points last night, including a hat trick. And that was just him putting on a show. And St. Louis is a better team than Montreal. So that's just kind of how I look at it. And he, he was just his skating last night, his ability to his shots, getting to the front of the net, getting to the dirty areas on the power play, just that wrister. He was just all over the ice last night and he couldn't be stopped. You know, Ryan O'Reilly, a great player, was a minus four last night. And for you, the old schoolers, that plus minus stat, I'm sure that, yeah, that hurts. Looks like a really bad night. I mean, you're on the ice for four goals. Not all created evenly, but um, minus four is minus four. Clearly, that's not a good matchup for um, Ryan O'Reilly. So he was going up against Nathan McKinnon, and he was getting torched. Um, and... You know, Bennington in game one, the game could have been 7-8-1 in game one. Bennington kept a minute. And you can see he's getting fatigued because they're just not providing enough. Uh, Grubauer wasn't fantastic last night, but he was good enough for, for Colorado to get the win. And I don't give a lot of hope to St. Louis because Colorado's just better. Colorado should win the Stanley Cup this year. If they – it's obviously health. Um, you got to put health parameters on that – on my take there. But – I'm not going to say, well, oh, if this guy gets hurt, because I'm going with the roster right now. You're going to lose players along the way. But if Nathan McKinnon's playing, if you have a goaltender, they should win the cup. To me, throughout these playoffs so far, we haven't seen the Toronto Maple Leafs play yet, but they're in my power rankings, they're not below the two teams I'm going to name. So they're not, they're not above the two teams I'm going to name. Colorado, Tampa Bay have been the two best teams to me. They look the most complete. And, you know, I think, Boston, Washington, they look pretty similar. So it's hard to kind of balance out who looks better. Vegas and, Vegas and Minnesota have been so tight, those games, that I think Vegas is a really, I think the best built team in the NHL. But it's hard to say that, you know, they look better than Minnesota. So just looking at the games in totality, 
Tampa in game two looked really impressive to me. They can play a low-scoring game, shut down the opposition, win that game. Colorado can outscore you. When Grubauer wants to and, he, and he's on his game, he can be one of the top 10 goaltenders in hockey. So there's confidence there. And I just, McKinnon, Ranton, and Landis Cog, we saw in game one, Landis Cog dropped the gloves with Braden Chen. And Braden Chen's, I, I didn't know Landis Cog had that in him. But the captain of the team, he fights Braden Chen, who's kind of a de facto captain in St. Louis, and he beats the hell out of him. Yeah, Braden Chen got some good shots, but Landis Cog won that fight. And it's a Gordie Howe hat trick. He sets the tone for the series. We see Ryan O'Reilly before the series say, we're going to win the series, having a little cocky bravado, which I like. But the first two games, Colorado basically said, yeah, good, better luck next time, chum, because they laid a beating on them twice. And last night's game wouldn't have been that close either. If not for, drum roll, please. A suspension looming. Um <laughs> So we're about halfway through the game last night and we see Justin Falk cut through the middle of the ice. He's moving pretty quick. And who comes across the other, the other side of the ice, but Nazem Kadri. And Nazem Kadri hits him directly in the head. This wasn't shoulder into head like uh, the Tom Wilson hit. This wasn't um, the other ones that I complained about being suspensions where a player turns. This was your face up. Nazem Kadri lifted his shoulder directly into the head of Justin Falk and he was given a match penalty. Um, Nazem Kadri, he's got a history of suspensions. He's been suspended in the regular season, but just looking at his playoffs, suspended three games for his hit on Tommy Wingles against the Boston Bruins. Then in uh, 2018, he was suspended for five for the rest of the series in game one against the Boston Bruins for his hit on Jake DeBrus from behind. This brings us to this. So his last suspension, five games, six games, sorry, because they went to seven. So it was the rest of the series. So they know it could have been at least six games. Uh, I, I don't know where they're going to go with this because if they say the rest of the series, well, Colorado is going to win this series and maybe they sweep them. So you miss two games. That's not a lot of punishment. I think they're going to have to set a number of games on this and set a precedent. And the last one was six. I don't know if he'll get six, but he's gotten three and then six. So this would be his third suspension in the playoffs. Do you go to 10? And I hate, I like physical play, but that was a dirty hit. Just like Sam Bennett's was a predatory hit. He charged from across the ice, nailed the guy from behind. He didn't turn. He didn't know he was coming. And I can't defend Nazem Kadri's hit because it was directly to the head. It was dirty. And looking at the play, I think it's at least five games because that's five, six games. That's what he got last time. And because it's a third time offender in a postseason, I got to suspect it could be more than six because that, that's what he got last time. You didn't learn your lesson. Um, he didn't get suspended in the playoffs last year in the bubble. So maybe because it's a year removed, it's not as heavy uh, in, in Toronto. When he suspended Wingles to uh, his hit on Wingles, then he hit on DeBrus. Those were back to back, but this, this was a to be fair. This was a lot like Tom Wilson's hit on Oscar Sundquist. If you ask me, it's just Kadri's not a big player. And, you know, he's not going to have the same impact that Tom Wilson would on a hit. It was very similar to me. And Tom Wilson got 20 games for that hit in the regular season. So if I'm Kadri, I'm expecting six plus. That's my guess. I'm going to, because he got six last time. I can't see being a 10 in the playoffs, even though they did do that to Rafi Torres. Um, we got 20. I'm going to say eight games. I think he's going to miss at least a full playoff series. So the rest of this series and potentially, you know, most of round two uh, for the, um, for the Colorado Avalanche. I'd be surprised if it was less than, than six games. I'm going to say eight. I'm going to say eight because I think they'll go up from the last one and maybe they will go to 10. But I, I think this is, he's a multi-time offender. It was a dirty hit. There's no gray area there. It's a dirty hit. And you can't walk that one back for Nazem Kadri. And we'll see. But I, it definitely hurts Colorado. I mean, he's their number two center. 
But the way McKinnon's been chugging, I think they'll be, be fine getting through St. Louis. But the big worry is, well, who are you playing in the second round? If Vegas comes out of their series against Minnesota, which has been a dogfight through two games, you, you need Nazem Kadri. You need that depth. And he'll be a big loss. But I'll keep my eyes and ears open on the suspension. If, if there's a hearing today, I'll let you guys know. Because like I'd be shocked if there wasn't. I think this guy will be suspended for a number of games. And we'll see how Colorado reacts and how St. Louis does. After the game, we saw a lot of their veterans weren't happy about it. But you know, St. Louis can't worry about getting even. They need to worry about trying to win a game here. Because game, uh, game three, Friday night, it's a must win. There's, there's series where you're like, well, you know, 3 nothing. maybe we can bounce back, whatever. We can make it a series. St. Louis isn't. You're not 3 nothing to Colorado, you're done. Pack your bags, book your trip to um, Punta Cana, get a private bird ready because you're going the hell home. Uh, and we'll see what they bring Friday night, but I don't suspect to see uh, Nelson Kadri uh, playing at uh, playing Friday night in St. Louis. Um, so those are the games last night. We got another four pack tonight. You know, it's four games every night. Love it. You know, just staggered times. You get games when there's intermissions, you get a game going, you get this TV, you get the computer, catch it all. And tonight we finally get the last series will kick off that everyone's been waiting for Toronto versus Montreal. The first series between the two teams since 1979. Um, oh, of course I'm going to watch it, but am I, am, I've said this from the beginning. Um, this is not the series I'm first, second, third, fourth, fifth most excited about. I don't have – I get it in Canada that the Canadian series are more compelling for Canadian viewers. I, mean, I get it, but I also don't get it because I just like watching the best hockey, but that's just me. I'm rational in that way. Um, but, you know, it's a big series. Again, I don't think there's a rivalry between these two teams. I don't think there's been a rivalry between these two teams in a very long time. And the reason I say that is because neither team has been very good. Um, you, you, they haven't played since 1979 in the playoffs. So clearly that, that's missing something. These teams haven't been good at the same time. We've seen Toronto in the early 2000s. They went through a run where they were real successful. 99, uh, you know, 2002, they go to a conference final in both those years. Montreal wasn't making the playoffs. Uh, we see Montreal going to a conference final run, losing to the Rangers in 2014. Toronto wasn't in the playoffs. Uh, Montreal in 2010 goes on a run to conference final. Toronto wasn't in the playoffs. Uh, so it, it's been a hit and miss, but we've seen Montreal lineup card to make some questionable decisions with Romanov, Caulfield, and Kokaniemi being out. I don't get it from Dominic Ducharme. Especially, I said last night under review, the one that just two that really, all three of them don't make sense, but Romanov not playing. You have a big, slow defense score. Maybe bring a guy into the lineup who's got some foot speed. Maybe have a little bit of differentiation on your blue line. Maybe. It's just a thought. I, I, that would have been my point of view on it, that you get guys that are a little bit different. Edmondson, Pete, uh, Edmondson Weber, Sherratt, uh, Kulak. They're all the same. Bringing a guy who's got something different, but Romanov's gone. Caulfield makes no sense to me. Yeah, I get it. He's a kid. And you don't want to, and I, the Toronto, uh, the, the Montreal media would, would bury this kid for not scoring a goal in the playoffs because they're Montreal media and a lot of them are just, I don't know why they like to bury their players, but they do. They do the same thing in Toronto. Uh, but you want to win the series. Who has been scoring goals to this team all year? The only two that have done it consistently are Tyler Toffoli and the unicorn Josh Anderson. And why is that going to change now? Brendan Gallagher hasn't played a month and a half. Carey Price hasn't played in a long period of time. Shea Weber's hurt. Who's providing offense for this team? Philip Dano? He hasn't all year. He's turning the light in the switch now. I'd have Cock Niemi as one of my centers because was he good in the regular season? No. But last year in the playoffs, he became a man. He was a monster against Pittsburgh. Playing up against Crosby, getting goals, being really productive. Let him have that chance. And they're not, and it's uh, it's infuriating to me that these three aren't in the lineup, and they're going with a more veteran lineup. Where, well, oh, if we struggle in game one, we'll insert the kids. Well, you're you're probably going to struggle in game one because you're playing a better team. I'd rather go down. Sw- I'd rather swing at the third pitch than watch strike three go by my eyes, 
So that's just me. And Ducharme, I think, is playing this like a pussy, quite frankly. I don't think he's putting the best lineup together. And it's like, well, I, we had the kids, but we didn't want to play them. He's got a fallback. You know, we didn't want to rush the kids into the lineup and face that pressure. Oh. So when you lose the series, you have something to lay your hat on and say, well, you know, we didn't have our best players because they're young and you know, insert French voice. It's a cop out for him to have an excuse to tell Mark Bergman, bring me back, bring me back. I want to be the head coach. Try to win this series, and you, you'll definitely be brought back. You beat Toronto in a playoff series, send them golfing in the uh, end of May, you're back. I guarantee you that. But I hate coaches that dress lineups, that they know they're going to change their lineup in game two. Play your best lineup from jump. And if the kids struggle, take them out. But I'd rather see them from game one than insert them and hope. Then you insert them in game two, and what, what are they? They're saviors. That's going to be the, uh, the narrative. Because they didn't play in game one. We need the kids to provide us some offense tonight. But so that's infuriating. What Toronto, what Montreal needs to do to make this competitive, limit Toronto's top six. Matthews, Marner, uh, Dano, Anderson. Uh, th- those guys got to make it difficult on Matthews on Mar- and Marner to score. You can live with, you know, the likes of Riley Nash and Kerfoot. If they beat you, well, something went wrong. Or Carey Price was garbage. Or if the fourth line geezers beat you, that's fine. But do not let Matthews and them bury you early. Play physical. You want to make it physical and see if Toronto reacts. And I think Toronto will. They're not the little Toronto Maple Leaf five foot nine forward team that they've had in the past couple of years. To Kyle Dubas's credit, it took a lot of convincing, but he finally saw the light and said, Okay, we all can't be 5-9 forwards and win playoff series. So look around the league. Who does that? And he's gotten a beefier team. He's gotten a tougher team. And, you know, um, he's, he's built a team that, that's playoff caliber, not, you know, uh, run-of-the-mill 1 of 82 in the regular season for the Toronto Maple Leafs or the North Division where there's no hitting. I suspect we'll see some hitting tonight because Montreal needs to if they're going to win. Montreal, throw some punches in Matthews' face early and see if – I want to see how he reacts anyway. To Mar- Mariner, Matthews, give them a face wash. Give them a slash. And I think they'll – I think we'll see a positive reaction from Matthews because he's, he's a guy who is competitive. He, he can be fiery when he needs to. And I think we'll see a motivated guy. But make him show you and make him prove it. And that, that's kind of what I want to see out of – um out of the Montreal Canadiens tonight and get, get involved in scrums, muck it up. And for Toronto, you're the heavy favorite. And, you know, I think last year they're the favorite against Columbus. And I've heard a rumor, I've heard different radio stations this week say, well, it was kind of a pick em series. And, okay. Revisionist history. Now that was a pick em series against Columbus. Okay. You can defend a loss if you want, I guess. We'll let, well, at least media do that. It was not a pick and series. They, should, they were the heavy favorite, and they gagged. Uh, but this Toronto, we can. I joke about them. They're still a very good team. The biggest thing they can do, the, the one thing they have to do this year, this is not even a request. I think this is a must. If you're a Leafs fan, you should have this mindset. If the Toronto Maple Leafs do not get into the third round of the playoffs, the season is a huge failure. Point blank. I don't care if they lose game seven, second round, quadruple overtime. It's a failure because you're never going to have an easier path to the third round. You don't get to play Boston, who they lose to when they see them, they shit their pants. You don't get to play Tampa. You don't get to play Florida. You don't have to play name a team, you know, that division is tough. You don't have to play any of them. You get to play the Montreal Canadiens, who have been an easy matchup for you this year, and then you get Edmonton, Winnipeg, who you've dominated also. You're favored against either of those teams. Next year, if you play Tampa, are you favored? No. Boston? You say they're aging. But again, until you beat a team, you're not favored. You got to beat them. And for, it starts tonight. What does Toronto have in their core? Do they have what it takes to 
win a playoffs. Win it starts tonight. Win game one, and move on from there. But it's a lot of it's a lot of pressure for sure. But it's also teams you've beaten all year, and you got to look at it that way. We've dominated this team all year. Let's just continue to do it and play our game. Do they have to hope for a couple of things? Yeah, they need to hope their power play wakes up because the last 30 games of the year was one of the worst in the NHL. The first 25 games was on a record pace. After that, it was just abysmal. So that's got to improve. Don't take stupid penalties and hope that, um, you know, the fourth line with the uh, Simmons, Thornton, Spezza, the geezer line, as I like to call it, can keep up. They do have a lot of options. They got Angval, they got Brooks, they got players sitting there. Travis Dermott, it's likely they said Zach Bogosian is going to play game one. So you have reserves that are ready to play for you, but um, it's honestly, it's on the big cats. And for Sheldon Keefe, for your defense pairings, spread out the minutes. Don't play Morgan Riley 28. Can't handle it. Don't do what Babcock and Carlisle tried to do and it didn't work. Play your top four a ton, spread out the minutes, You'll be fine. So game one tonight, 8.30, Toronto, Montreal. The uh, series heard around the world, and we'll see what uh, what these two teams bring to the table tonight. Also tonight, we'll see Tampa Bay, Florida, game three. Uh, must win for the Florida Panthers. Uh, you're playing the defending Stanley Cup champions. You lose both of your first two games on home ice. Really intriguing thing for me will be who's starting in net. Is it Drieger? Is it, they, do they go back to goalie Bob? I mean, Drieger let in two goals. On, uh, on Tuesday. So I suspect we'll see Chris Drieger again, but it's Joel Quenville. Who knows? He could easily go back to Bobrovsky. He's not afraid to make in-game switches. We've seen him sit Corey Crawford for Scott Darling when he's a member of the Chicago Blackhawks. He ultimately went back to Scott Darling. Went back to Corey Crawford. Sorry, they won a cup. So he's not afraid to take a risk to do things a little bit unconventional. So that's game three tonight. Um, we have Florida. Sam Bennett will be back into the lineup. They need to hope that they can get some more scoring. Uh, and they want to, I think game one is more their style. Get more physical. Game two is a little too quiet for me. Florida, get involved physically with Tampa, beat them up a little bit and see what they got. You know, they, they limped into the playoffs with players injured. See what, what kind of reserves they have right now. Pittsburgh will head to Nassau Coliseum to play the Islanders tonight for game three. Game one, obviously, Paul Mary scores in overtime. 2-1 win for Pittsburgh in game two. Varlamov would stay in the net. I don't question that move to put him in net after game one. He's their starting goaltender. He has been since he signed there. You go to him. And he lighted up terrible goal early by Brian Rust. But after that, he settled in. He made 43 saves on the night out of 45. That's a really solid performance. For the Islanders, you need to find some more offense. They score one goal in game two. Josh Bailey with a beautiful backhand. But, you know, they got Barzell playing with Komarov and Everly right now. I love Leo Komarov, but if I'm Barry Trotz, I'm putting Barzell on with different guys. I would look at him with a Wallstrom, with a Brock Nelson. See if you can get him a spark. Everly's been too quiet for me, and that could be part of the problem with this line. But Everly's been a little off. His pa- He's not catching passes very effectively. And you need that line to chug. You need Barzell to be a difference maker. He's one of the few guys that could make a huge difference in this series. But two one-goal games, I suspect there'll be another tight-checking affair tonight uh, where we'll see a ton of Matt Martin, a ton of uh, Sezikis and Clutterbuck. And, um, but intriguing nonetheless, we'll see who can come out on top. And then the nightcap, we got Vegas and Minnesota. Game three from Minnesota, uh, Vegas uh, winning game two, 3-1. But it's, it's been a goalie affair so far. Marc-Andre Fleury was brilliant in game two, brilliant in game one. Uh, but uh, can Minnesota find some goal scoring? They had two goals in two games. It's not good enough. Uh, they need some guys. They need Kaprizov to, to find the back of the net. Erickson Act to continue to drive some offense. Their blue, uh, blue line with Dumba, Spurgeon. Get some shots through, get some deflections. Make life difficult on Marc-Andre Fleury because he's been fantastic through the first two. But you need to make it tougher in the sea pucks and make it a difficult night for him. And on that Vegas blue line, when it comes to Vegas, you know, they haven't had Max patch already the whole series yet. He would be a huge addition. He's been their most consistent goal scorer all year and missing him. is clearly hurt. Cause you see their lines. They're just not as confident. And he's, he's a game breaker. He can get the puck on the wing. He can score a goal within seconds. So 
game three, I mean, that series has been sneaky good. Obviously, the games are on late, but it, it's been must-watch television for me when it comes to watching Vegas, watching Minnesota. These two teams both love to play great hockey, and I think we'll we'll see that again tonight. So a um, lot of action tonight in the NHL. Uh, again, I almost threw it an hour here on the podcast talking just about the, the NHL. I mean, that's just where it's at right now. A lot of, a lot of playoff action, a lot of interesting details. And, um, it's every night you got, I, I love it. You know, this is what, this is what I live for when it comes to hockey and, and playoff action like this. Also last night we saw the NBA playing tournament and the first night of it was a little lackluster. The Indiana Pacers crushed the Charlotte Hornets, uh, getting 144 points. That wasn't going to be a big brand name game anyway. And then in the nightcap, we saw Boston Celtics play the Washington Wizards. Celtics getting the better of the Wizards, uh, beating them 118-100, behind Jason Tatum's 50-point game. Winning that game guarantees the Celtics the seventh seed. They're going to be playing the Brooklyn Nets in the first round of the playoffs, which is a tough matchup for them because Brooklyn's fully healthy with uh, James Harden, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving all together. And uh, I think that'll be a very difficult task for Boston to even keep that series competitive. But tonight we'll see Indiana play Washington. Uh, the winner of that game will be the eight seed in the playoffs. So winner of that game will play uh, Philadelphia in the first round. And Washington's beat up. They should win this game, but they got injuries. Russell Westbrook's ding. Bradley Beal's hurt. So with your two best players – nicked up it gives indiana a good chance to maybe sneak away and get into the playoffs uh under nate bjorker and the first year head coach so that'll be tonight last night we saw memphis uh beat san antonio it was memphis was cruising early but they left their foot off the gas san antonio gets back in the game deontay murray gets a triple double rudy gay is a big game off the bench but um john morant uh, dylan brooks the canadian out of vancouver come up big uh dylan brooks gets 24 points Former Toronto Raptor Jonas Valanciunas gets 25 points, 24 rebounds for a huge game, first uh, 2020 game in Grizzlies history, and they sneak away with a 196 win over San Antonio. And th- they'll play Friday night against the Golden State Warriors because in the marquee game last night, it was Lakers-Warriors, and uh, the biggest playing game that there is because you get LeBron James and the Lakers coming off winning the championship last year they fall to the seventh seed. They have to play in this playing game. And you have injuries all year where, where LeBron and Anthony Davis and, you know, uh, Dennis Schroeder. And they come in this game a little bit limpy. Uh, they had won five in a row, but there had been some talk that they're a little dinged. And uh, LeBron wasn't great last night. You know, if I had to grade his performance, I'd probably give him a C plus, C, just a C. But he was clutch when he needed to be. The last second at the buzzer, game's tied at 97. He takes a step back three puts it through the hoop, Lakers move on. Um, they they did a good job guarding Steph Curry. They kept him to 37 points. And But to the, to the Warriors' credit, they did not give up. Toscano Anderson, Jordan Poole, Draymond Green had five blocks in the game. This game shouldn't have been that close, and it was. The Warriors are without Clay Thompson. They don't have Kevin Durant anymore. They do not have James Wiseman. They don't have Kelly Oubre Jr. And yet they still lose by only three points, and it shows the resolve of a championship team. They still have that DNA in them to, to keep fighting and, and not give up despite, you know, the, uh, the long odds of winning the game, but credit to LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Uh, neither of them were great last night. Their shooting was lackluster. Free throw shooting was a disaster, but they get through it. And that sets them up for a matchup with the Phoenix suns beginning Sunday afternoon and poor Phoenix. You, know, you have the, Great season. You're the second seed in the West. You only miss out by being the first seed by a game to the Utah Jazz. Monty Williams wins coach of the year. And now you got the Lakers in the first round. And when the Lakers are healthy, they're better than Phoenix. And I'll be interested to see what the Vegas odds are. But I guarantee you that Phoenix is the underdog in this series, being the home team, the two seed. And it's crazy to think of what they will be because – you got LeBron, you got Anthony Davis. When they're healthy, they're better than Chris Paul, uh, Devin Booker, DeAndre Ayton, you know, Cam Johnson, you name it. And we'll see, but I feel terrible for Phoenix because now you got to go against the Lakers in the first round, potentially could be bounced. 
and you know, a great season could go to waste. But Chris Paul, he's a fighter. He's been in a lot of playoff matchups before. I'm sure he's reveling in the opportunity to upset the Lakers, send LeBron home early. They are really good friends. But when it comes to the playoffs, there are no friends. And friendships thrown at the door. Uh, you want to advance. And Chris Paul has never won an NBA title. He's been a fantastic player. Will be a Hall of Famer one day. But he Oklahoma City turns that franchise around last year, losing the first round. You don't want to have the same thing happen to Phoenix this year. They're on the rise, but Chris Paul is only getting older, and you want this year to be a success. And if you could pull off an upset, dethrone the champs, that would be a massive storyline uh, in the NBA world and, and the world of sports, for that matter. But we'll see Memphis play Golden State tomorrow night. The, the winner of that game will play the Utah Jazz in the first round. I'm sure the NBA is hoping Golden State can find a way to advance because I think they'll definitely provide more entertainment than Utah versus Memphis. I don't think that'll be a highly – watch series if you get golden state in there at least you get steph curry you're going to get a few more eyeballs and but you know nba season uh, start, uh nba playoffs starting saturday proper uh, like i said me doing a podcast with with my friend harry shooting belt um on friday uh, tomorrow where we break break it all down uh, should be a lot of fun he's a big gambler so he'll give you some gambling tips as well along the way so keep your eyes and ears open for that as that will drop um this weekend and before we wrap today, I thought we'd just start by talking about the PJ Championship. And, you know, beautiful course down in Kiowa. Um, you got some great groups. You got McElroy, Kepka uh, playing together today with Jordan Spieth. You got tonight, you got um, uh, John Rahm and Sh- Shoffley playing together. So throughout the day, you get some really great groups playing together. Early morning today, you got John Daly teeing it up, uh, who – who doesn't love seeing John Daly out in a golf course? Can't get the cart down here. He's usually playing in the cart in the Champions Tour, blowing darts. But that's not happening. But as you get to a major, it's anybody's game. But, you know, there's big names you think of. I think Justin Thomas is clearly a favorite. Uh, Rory McIlroy winning a couple weeks ago, playing at this course before and dominating it. He's clearly a favorite. Jordan Spieth, you know, after years of just ineptitude, he's playing some great golf this, this year. And, it wouldn't shock me to see him win this tournament. But what I love about it is there's so many great players. And, you know, Victor Hovland, he's a young guy. Wouldn't shock me if he won. Matthew Wolf. I mean, these younger guys can, can win these tournaments. And I'm really looking forward to the weekend to see what, what happens. But golf, you know, I hear all the time, it's so boring to watch. It's not boring to watch anymore. These guys crush the ball nearly 400 yards. You see them, you know, on par fives trying to make it uh, onto the green and two go for that eagle putt every time like we saw last week this this is a tough course but i think the best players will find a way to avoid it another big storyline for me is can dustin johnson turn it around he's had a tough season he's been out with a knee injury can he win can he even get in contention the masters he missed the cut how will he do this weekend at kiowa obviously one of the best players in the world number one right now but can, also can john Rahm break through he's never won a major can John Rahm finally win his first major title? So lots of storylines down in Kiowa. We'll talk about it tomorrow throughout the weekend as um, the PGA Championship tees up um, down, down at the uh, Kiowa Islands today. So I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the playoffs so far. I know I have um, lots more coming in here to the, on to the point. I'm prepping a round table next, coming week, next couple of weeks about women's hockey, which I'm really looking forward to. So I'll keep you guys uh, up to date on that, kind of uh, about the sport, where it's at when it comes to pay, visibility, what what can they do better to promote the women of the game. So um, have a great have a great day, everybody. Enjoy the uh, the start of the uh, Toronto Montreal series tonight. I'm sure everybody will be glued to that. So enjoy the game. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll talk soon.